When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, everything changed. The United States was now at war. The military needed men and supplies. All of a sudden, there were more jobs to do than workers. The Depression was over. In spite of the war, the country's mood was upbeat. There was a common goal, and everybody pitched in to help. To win the war, the nation needed ships in a hurry. Henry Kaiser's Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation used mass production methods to build hundreds of ships in record time. Swan Island became known as the Yard of Champions because of the speed with which it turned out warships. And finally, only about 70 days after the laying of the first keel section, the papers are delivered to the skipper who is to take the tanker out on her maiden voyage. The shipyards helped fuel another population boom. 160,000 workers came to Oregon during the war, many on trains called Magic Carpet Specials. Their worker shortage also brought a new look to the workforce. Workers in the Kaiser Yards included women who were not going to war, who were here and available. And they went to work as riveters and assemblers. 25,000 blacks were also recruited to the shipyards. Overnight, Portland's black population increased tenfold. The new wartime population, black and white, needed somewhere to live. Public housing went up almost overnight. The largest was Vanport. Built on the floodplain south of Jansen Beach, it became Oregon's second largest city. Projects like Vanport, not to mention army barracks, meant renewed demand for Oregon lumber. But just when loggers were finally needed in the woods, many had gone off to join the army. Oregon's farms faced a similar labor shortage, so workers were brought up from Mexico to work in the fields. After the war, many stayed. Spanish-speaking migrants today constitute Oregon's largest minority. The war also created a need for all that Bonneville Dam power. Modern planes required strong and lightweight aluminum, and making aluminum required great amounts of electric power. A thriving aluminum industry sprang up along the Columbia River to take advantage of the previously surplus electricity. Oregon's population growth turned out to be the state's lasting legacy of World War II. But just six months after Pearl Harbor, Oregon did make headlines because of an event that turned out to be insignificant. A Japanese uh, vessel surfaced and shelled Fort Stevens at the mouth of Columbia River, lobbing uh, shells in, in against the sand uh, at that fortification. It was the first attack on a mainland U.S. military installation since the War of 1812. The attack lasted just 15 minutes. No one was hurt and the fort sustained no damage. Japan also launched balloons designed to carry bombs across the Pacific to the U.S. Most never made it, but one that did proved deadly. On May 5th, 1945, Reverend and Mrs. Mitchell of Bly, Oregon, took five children on an outing. While Mr. Mitchell was moving the car, Mrs. Mitchell and the children found a strange object in the woods. While investigating, they must have tugged on it enough to detonate the bomb. Today, in the mountains east of Bly, a monument marks the spot where they died, the only deaths on the American continent due to enemy action during the war. Fearing a possible attack, the United States sent Japanese Americans on the West Coast to internment camps, where they endured the war behind barbed wire. They lost their farms, they lost their possessions, their automobiles, their furniture, their bank accounts in many instances. Uh, and it was years, decades, before any uh, uh, reparations were made for those losses. For most Oregonians, the war economy meant good jobs, but with constraints on spending the good wages. There was rationing of tires and gasoline. New automobiles weren't available. So what happened is they saved their money and they helped create the pent-up demand for housing and consumer goods that would drive the economy after 1945. 
Demand for housing was so strong after the war that Oregon timber companies couldn't keep up with the demand. For the first time, the government began large-scale timber sales from national forest lands. By 1963, harvest of trees from federal land exceeded that from private land. Timber was king. During the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Oregon supplied about one quarter of all the lumber used in the U.S. There were warnings that we were cutting too fast, but those concerns were mostly ignored. It looked as if the good times could last forever. In 